The man of streaks has continued. I just noticed the streak you of a non-black, no, no black shirt. Yep. This is this is becoming and like you're wearing like two shirts. Like you're really spinning it up. Like this. Yeah. Is, yeah. Like I said, man, I got too much stuff. It just occupies my brain, and uh, I just I gotta be a little more free. Like Feels that. good. Yeah. I like that. Well, did you like our photo shoot last week? That was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I really we, should we can't really. I should have brought. Oh, we can't talk about. Can't really it. announce what shoot. everything is for, but yeah, we, we had to partake in a photo shoot last week, and that that was fun. I didn't know we were. I didn't know we weren't allowed to say anything. Anyway, we did a thing. Well, Keep some pictures. People will know. Blah. But the monumental piece of this event was in your car. Uh, um, I, uh, so we're in Tim's car. Can I tell the story? It's just got. It's... Yeah, I mean, you can. Yeah, it's fine. Tim has a car. It it drives itself. There are these new lanes on 64 with the HOV that are divided. And we get into the the lane. And when the car wants to move over, it can't. And it redirected us to ride the entire beltway basically around the region. And it was magical and I couldn't stop laughing the entire time. Because uh, I love technology. It uh, It tried. And hopefully it was a good thing your car was juiced up enough because if not we would have been in a, a big big mess of trouble oh that there's plenty of juice that thing can go uh i, I yeah i'm eager it can, we it can go very very far uh but i'm eager to uh to try it again just because with the machine learning aspect now it knows we had to be the uh the educator i think you literally were guinea pig like that road had just opened up to do that you're probably the first yeah. tesla to be on it and so that was that was fun to be a well the crazy thing was yeah. is that uh how long that stinking hov lane was that thing was <laughs> like there's miles. you were stuck i mean you were you were on it i mean like oh, it was, that hov was longer than uh uh the one from 564 to 264 i mean like that's that was you're you were on it for a minute probably longer than all the tunnels combined it was a magical thing uh it was, it was fun to experience but yeah, I'm looking forward to, I don't know, our guest today may be the busiest person in Hampton Roads. Oh, wow. Looking forward to having Greg Garrett on the show. And, and Greg, you're probably familiar with all the HOVs and uh, all the construction progress uh, projects going on around the, the Hampton Roads area. Yeah, I'm the guy that uh, actually has it's his own private lane on 64 and 264. I don't know if you guys know about that, but there's like one lane that nobody uses. And unfortunately, that lane has lots of nails and screws and little <laughs> shame. Because I've actually in the last year, I've actually picked up five nails, five, five nails or shanks in my tires in one tire or the other. And I'm pretty sure I get that from my own private lane that I have on 64 and 264, but People it's, still, it, yeah. it's still worth it. I, you know, it's funny that you say that. So like my, my wife, like that is her, like, like her calling when we, whenever we're walking, even if, if we are at an intersection, she'll look out of the window and she'll see a nail or a screw on the road. And she makes it a point to pick up every single nail and screw that we see along walks or if we're driving. She's got to, to do a better the, job for me. She's got to well, tell us she's failing me. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make that a deal. I get it. But I, I would like to think, knock on wood, that we're on the right side of karma uh, mm. with with in that regard. But I got new tires yesterday. I had run flats on my car. And I discovered yesterday that run flats are uh, at least it, it, they're, they're about they're about almost double the cost of like regular tires. Uh, but I, um, I put on regular tires and got rid of the run, run flats yesterday. I'm going to see, I'm now going to do my own test to determine <laughs> if run flats pick up nails more or less than regular tires. And I'm going to, and that, and it's a scientific test that I have a year to do it, but that means that I have to continue using my own private lane in spite of what, you know, maybe a trooper or some other person <laughs> that wants to interrupt me or, you know, 
uh, would say, but I, I'm going to be able to say to them, I am doing a test. This is a legitimate test that I'm doing. Of course. And, and you, you, know, you can stop me if you want and you can intervene and you have the authority, but I don't think you should. You're interfering with progress and research. Yeah, we need the data points. Yeah, I mean, this That's is right. absolutely incredible. Yeah. I, uh, uh, incredibly important to this region to figure out, you know, what tires make sense to buy when you're on your own lane. I mean, phew. I mean, perfect. thank you, Zach, for being with me on that. I mean, you look like the captain of the ship. You got the leather jacket on. You got, I mean, it's just, you, you got it, it, perfect guy for the job. I mean. Let's see if the trooper buys it when, he, when I get stopped. But I'm going to try. Hello, officer. Zach's my witness, and, and Ryan, Tim Ryan did not disagree. I'm with you. So, uh yeah, you're busy. What's 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 occupying most of your time right now? Well, I mean, my uh, my job, in, in from my perspective, my job is really to open up doors uh, for people and and really try to to you know elevate others in in the different businesses that we have. I mean, I I most of my time is spent in the real estate business. I mean, that's what I started doing when I was 19, and uh, still really helping people to help people buy and sell houses. Uh, and that's the, that's the majority of my time. So the most of our agents, most of our partners, most of our employees, uh, independent contractors are connected to the residential real estate brokerage business. And so we continue to, you know, deal with all the challenges in that and, and are, are growing the company as we grow the people, because it's all about growing the people, finding new people, that want to build a career and and uh, so that's it but the other businesses as well many other businesses that we're trying to elevate and, and again elevate the people inside of those businesses what, what, is, what is your take right now of the housing market within hampton roads so <clears throat> we we have a housing shortage that can only be solved by building new houses Hundred percent. There is no way where it's going to be solved by doing anything other than building new houses, higher density, which is the, the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard people hate it. Mm -hmm. we need higher density. We need more walkable neighborhoods. We need more redevelopment. And what you're going to see is significant. Mark my words. Significant appreciation. Significant and people don't get that real estate where people think prices have gone up yes they've gone up but we're the cheapest of all other regions that we compete with and so if and and, and if you can only solve it by new construction and new construction is 30 to 35 percent higher than an equivalent size resale then the resales are going to come up as new construction goes up the resales are going to go up i sold my son in in connecticut i sold my son a house in ocean view yesterday and the son lives in Connecticut. He's buying it as a rental property, as is. And as is rental property, he just, we just ratified it last night at 8 o'clock, right? And, and why is he doing that? Well, he lives in a neighborhood in Connecticut that the teardowns are now over $3 million. Teardowns. I'm talking about less than an acre. A little neighborhood called Old Greenwich. And so he's looking at, he just bought a Ocean View property on the bay for four hundred thousand dollars. It's a town. It's a townhouse condo. It's not a big deal. It needs a bunch of work, but he just bought it for basically four hundred thousand dollars. And so, when you're in a neighborhood on the east coast of the United States, the teardowns not on the water are three million. Why would you not think that a four hundred thousand dollar condo on the Chesapeake Bay is a pretty good deal, right? It's so yeah. the greatest on the curve in multiple ways. And that's why I see a tremendous upside over the next 10 years. Plus, we finally, we finally, even though statistics don't show it yet, I guarantee you that we're going to be able to look back on last year and this year and next year. We're going to be able to look back and see that we've had a significant uh, increase in population. We haven't had a population increase since that we've really recognized since sequestration and we lost so many people. Well, from that point, I think when I moved here, I think we were market 43 and I think we're like 37 now. And the number actually from a population has changed. So actually, I guess other cities have, have shrunk maybe is, is how that's gone. But I always thought that was interesting. So from a NIMBY perspective, 
I tend to think that people would be like that because they like the slowness of this area or it's not as fast paced as some of the other areas. And so to then change that, that, that content, uh, potentially, you know, the curb appeal of that is, is not as sexy as, as something different. And so maybe that's why people well, what, feel the way I, that they do. My friends that are my age and older, tend to not want to see as much change as I want to see. My friends that are 50 and younger, especially 45 and younger, they're anxious for all kinds of change and all kinds of progress that we're not, they're current, we're not seeing fast enough. We're seeing it, but we're not seeing it fast enough. But at the same time, it's too fast for people that are, that are scaling down, retiring, you know, et cetera. And what I say to them, the people that want to see less progress, move out of Norfolk, move out of Portsmouth, move out of the hot areas of Virginia Beach, you know, and go to rural Chesapeake, go to Pungo, go to uh, Surrey, go to James City County. I mean, there's plenty of places where you go to New Kent, right? New Kent 30, 40 years from now is going to be a crazy thriving place as this mega region comes together. But over the next 10 or 20 years, at least the next 10 years, New Kent will be a pretty calm place. And so go to one of those places and, and you're living in a, these people are living in a two story house. You know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm denying my, my age. I just bought a four story house, you know, a four story <laughs> townhouse. We're moving in it in about two weeks, but, but, you know, the, the, you know, people, if you want a slower place, go get a rancher out in James City County, out in Pungo, out somewhere and have that calm lifestyle. But you're not going to have it on Granby Street, right? It's it's not going to be a calm, you know, chill life, life, lifestyle that with, with no people around and no cars. Yeah, it's just... That is, and how do you balance that? Yeah, you know, because like, I think that you're 100 percent right. The young people want to see change, and the, the what's happening isn't fast enough, right? And the older people don't want to see the change because it's already too fast. And and a lot of times they seem to be the decision makers in terms of uh, controlling the pace of change. And that's one of the things I am very determined to change. I am very well. Downtown Norfolk. Downtown Norfolk's interesting just to use that as an example, right? That's where Hatch used to be. So like you have this urban core, but then you also have this neighborhood in there that is primarily, I would think 55 and older. And so you have your urban core that is 65 and older. I was being generous. Come on, Greg. <laughs> so you know, are cool, there are totally cool 80 year olds that want to be you know, in downtown Norfolk. I mean, there's, it, it's, so, but it's, it, it, to an extent, to yeah, an extent. It's, I mean, it's, it's they're not closing the bars music. at 10 o'clock. Like there's a lot of weirdness going on on Granby Street. Yes. That's like, if you're a true urban core, that 10 to 2 a.m. time in a city is going to be lively. And when you're removing that from an area, expecting, you know, young folks to be, to, to want to be involved in that and you're the only city in the country that does that it's just a little fishy and yes, so it's, it's ridiculous it, and it's ridiculous it's and it, it, it shouldn't be you happening people don't want to go down there if when they want to go out it's between 10 and 2 and nothing's open because you've closed everything because of some new ordinance i mean it's just it's just odd it's fishy it's what are you trying to do? So my oldest son is 41, the one that just bought the house. When he was 10 years old, we celebrated his 10th birthday by going to New York. And he and I took our rollerblades with us. We were, oh, and we cool. were rollerblading around Little Italy and all these places at 11, 12 o'clock at night. Now, his mother got mad. I, I, you know, I get it because we're rollerblading on the streets, on the sidewalks. But we're rollerblading all through New York City, Manhattan. It was so cool. Guess where he lived when he graduated from college? Guess where he lived in summers while he was in college? Guess where he got to work for a private equity firm? Guess where he ended up with a hedge, hedge fund, working for a hedge fund? He, he was attracted to the city and he loved a city that he, they would go out at nine or 10 at night. I mean, yeah. bars closing at 10 o'clock. Are you kidding me? When he was, you know, before he had kids, 
they would they would leave their uh, condo or their townhouse, uh, not townhouse. They would leave their apartment. I guess it was. They would leave their apartment at 9 30, 10 o'clock, right? And so not not return because the sidewalks were rolled up. <laughs> we got to fix that. And the, the whole NIMBY thing, it's the same thing with short term rentals. We're having short term rental debates in almost every city right now. The only city that I know that I know that I know that I know is on the brink of doing it right is the city of Hampton. 13 stakeholders meetings with a bunch of people in the room that did not want any short term rentals in their neighborhoods, a staff and, a, and some short term rental advocates. What do you think? What do you think the pushback is with the short term rentals? Is it they don't want parties? I, I mean, when I have a text message from one of the city councilmen from one of our wonderful cities saying people like me do not want. Of course, you know, this person is 60 ish years old, maybe maybe more uh, people like me. He was saying she he or she was saying do not want short term rentals all around them. And my response was. I don't want short term rentals all around me. Nobody wants short term rentals all around them. But the answer is not to do what Newport News in Virginia Beach has done and said no short term rentals, period, in any place except Virginia Beach, one little strip of oceanfront in Sandbridge by state. Yeah, but don't you think in Virginia Beach it's because the lobbyists and the hotels are saying that because well, they don't want to be competing that against that? I, yeah. I, I, the only thing I can say for sure is the rule is a bad rule. The source of the rule, that's one of the theories of the source of the rule. I cannot say what the source of the rule is, but no matter who is behind a bad law, we need to fix it. And Hampton is on the brink of doing it. Every city would look at what Hampton did and all of the incredible effort Hampton did by putting the, the I don't wants and the I wants in, in the room together because the people that want short term rental anarchy are going to lose. And they're going to ruin our cities if we allow them to control. And the people that don't want any short-term rental anywhere, we're going to lose. And so, but putting that together, like Hampton is saying, hey, there's a couple of neighborhoods where maybe it could be two or three percent of short-term rentals, like down by Buckrow Beach. And then there, then but the rest of the city, let's cap it at like one percent and see if it works out. You know, and 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 so the the idea that I don't want short-term rentals all around me, okay. If it's 1% or 2%, one out of 100, two out of 100, you can't get short term rentals all around me. Right. So the city of Hampton divided the city of Hampton into about 40 little sections, 40 little sections of Hampton. And each of those 40 sections have 600 or 1,200 people. So if one of those sections has 1,000 people, a th excuse me, 1,000 homes, 1,000 dwellings, you can have 10 short term rentals. How can short term rentals that are not actually bad anyway? that actually are regulated by reviews, that actually the free enterprise system really works, one out of, a, I mean, 10 out of a thousand cannot ruin a neighborhood or put short-term rentals all around anybody. And so it's, 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 a, it's a lack of education of how to do it right. And I'm so proud of the people in Hampton because they're on the brink. They haven't accepted it yet, but the staff's recommendation is excellent in the city of Hampton. It can be done right. Yeah, that. Uh, I mean, I know for us, uh, with uh, when we travel with a family of four, it's expensive to to like to do two hotel rooms. It's just a whole lot easier, and it's so it's not a bunch of uh, college kids looking to uh, have a have a banger and go crazy. It's, if, you family, uh, if you want family tourism, you like Airbnb. If we want, right. if we want families to come here and go to our aquatic centers, go to our uh, aquariums go to come to our beaches you know do all the things that these great things that we have available here if we want families to come here for track meets and basketball tournaments and jazz festivals and something in the water if we want them to come here we need airbnbs because you just said two hotel rooms so what do you do you you and your spouse sleep in a different hotel room you don't sleep together you don't stay together because you because you're, you're there to protect the kids i mean is that the way you want to do your vacation I mean, it just doesn't make sense when right. I, I'm my daughter's getting married next month. And we're going down to North Carolina for the wedding. We found houses next to each other. We have couples coming in from Texas, from Virginia Beach, from uh, Newport News, from uh, North Carolina. And we're all going to be sharing two houses together. We're going to have breakfast together. 
I mean, do you think we're going to be up playing the banjo at two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> naked in the front yard? No, we're probably not going to do that. Yeah. He said probably. So there's still a chance. <laughs> and, if, and if we do that, here's the other thing about short term rentals. If Tim does that in the home that he owns, Okay, let's pretend that, you know, that this is just a pretend scenario. But let's say Tim owns his home and he's playing banjo in his front yard in a jock strap at two o'clock in the morning. Okay, he owns his own home. We're stuck with Tim. We're never going to get Tim out of the neighborhood. Zach, let's pretend Zach is a long term tenant. Somehow, long term tenants apparently are good. I, I don't know why, but long term tenants are good. I've got good ones, I've got bad ones in our real estate company. But Zach, let's pretend, is a long term tenant. And he and he is playing banjo and a jock strap in his front yard at two o'clock in the morning and waking everybody up. It will take us three to nine months to get him out. But if I'm doing it in a short term rental, you can get me out by police action in two hours. Two hours is about what it takes. So do you want Tim playing banjo and a jock strap two o'clock in the morning? We never get rid of him. Zach, it takes six months to get rid of him. Or me, who you can get rid of in two hours, because I am a I am a short term tenant. Well, I mean, these are visibles, um, visuals, yeah. visuals that I've always wanted to see. Um, so I appreciate. <laughs> um, let's put that in the AI machine. Jock strap, Zach banjo, two in the morning, out of bed, right. you know, raging against Stand, the standing ovation. Take it to four in the morning. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm be we could do that on Granby Street. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg, so I'm at, curious. Night, oh, I'm, I'm just curious, real uh, as as we got you fired up a little bit. What what's your take on this whole new uh, real estate ruling uh, with the courts? You know how how does that affect your business? What's your take? Yeah, so um, it is not catastrophic. It is not game changing. There are a lot of misperceptions. I mean, almost every article that I see written about it and almost every question that I'm given, and I appreciate you not giving me a, a more specific question than you did. You, you left it pretty open without making any assumptions just now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get questions like, what are y'all going to do now that real estate commissions cannot be 6% anymore? Well, let me answer that. Real estate uh, commissions could have always been less than 1% or more than 20%. There's never been a number that real estate commissions had to be. Um, and so I get that question and, and what, you know, what I see that and people say, well, you know, how, why, why was NAR national association of realtors so dumb that they established a commission rate and now they're, I'm glad they're in trouble that they became established commission rate. Well, there was never established. There was never a commission rate established. Commissions have always been negotiable. And, and, and then people say, well, what are you going to do now that buyers are going to have to start paying their own commissions? How can they do that? Or do you think they have the money to do that? Well, buyers are not going to start paying their own commissions. If the seller wants to sell their house, they're still going to pay the commission. And they're probably still going to pay a commission for an agent representing the seller and a commission for the agent that represents the buyer. And while it could be different in every situation, I don't think it's going to be categorically different in, in re the residential real estate market overall. The big the, one of the biggest changes is in our multiple listing system. Uh, agents now, if you look at 10 houses that are for sale, you see the number that the agent that the seller through the eight listing agent is offering for the buyer's agent. You see that in the MLS. And if, 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 if the judge accepts the settlement offered by the National Association of Realtors, then multiple listing services connected to the National Association of Realtors, which by the way, the local Hampton Roads uh, MLS is not connected to the National Association of Realtors. But if that's if that is accepted by the judge, then the multiple listing services cannot publish the amount offered to agents for the buyer. I don't understand what difference it makes. I don't understand why offering that, putting that in the listing is good or bad. But all that means is, as a real estate company, we can set up our own website that other real estate people can look at and see the commission that's offered to the buyer's agent. So I just 
it could be slightly inconvenient. It's not going to be game changing. It's not going to be catastrophic. It's not going to make houses go up or down, values go up or down. I mean, these theories that this is going to make houses go down, it's just it's just ludicrous. It's somebody speaking that's, that's, that thinks they're a journalist that has done no research, no homework, and doesn't have any idea of what the reality is. Yeah, why are you taking my comment away? That's great. As a former journalist, my point was going to be a lot of a lot of interviewers have zero context on the the subject they're about to do a story on. And so like they, they didn't even have the context of this, like, hey, what was the standard before? The standard was this. Oh, actually, it's been there forever. You just didn't know about it. So you're trying to manipulate and word this in a weird kind of way to make us look like idiots. And so it's like we want we want this negative reaction most of the time. There's this quick soundbite to get us to react in such a jarring way. And I don't know. That's something that always irked me about journalism world coming from that world. Like that's what my degree is in. And I'm just like, Hey, like, why don't we give these people a grain of salt, give them a little bit of a, you know, maybe a sympathy uh, when you don't even know them. Right. And it's just, it's just, it's just obnoxious to me. It's like, Oh, tell me what you think. And it's like, well, do you even know what you're asking in this subject? Yeah. Right. You don't even you're know not an question. expert. Yeah, you don't even know the right questions to ask sometimes, right? Right. And you're right. reporting on something as if you understand. Well, the reason I knew what you were going to say. Watch the news every night. You can hear that. I mean, right. it's obnoxious. Oh, yes. Zach, the reason I knew what you were going to say, you young folks think AI is really cool. But, you know, I've, yeah. I've, I've gone beyond AI and I've gone to MR. And so it, MR allows you to do things that AI doesn't allow. The, so, Mr., what is, what is MR? Mind reading. Mind reading. Oh. It's stronger than AI. It's a stronger power than AI. Okay. So if you are such a good mind reader, over the last minute, why did Tim mute his microphone? <laughs> I don't want to say it's embarrassing. <laughs> I, don't want to, I would not want to embarrass Tim. You're telling that. Okay. Well, Greg, you're familiar. I mean, it's just it happens every every Thursday around 11. Yeah, we have these things called F-22s. And, uh, you know, they, they like to... They're either they're either going to lunch or they're coming back for lunch. I don't know what it is uh, they're doing this time, but they like to fly around. Exactly. So what else is going on, guys? I, Where are you right now? That's a nice view. It's uh, one of our conference rooms at uh, our okay. news office. I like that look. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, gosh, you started this journey at 19, and it's a. Uh, what you don't ever seem to get tired you just keep on going like take take us i don't know i just think it's a fascinating thing if you could sum up like your your story in a, in a couple of minutes i mean like it's just fascinating Here's, what you've been so, able to do uh, uh, first uh, a, a microcosm of my story can be told by telling you several things that happened when i was 19. so um four didn't kill me and two helped me so the four that didn't kill me, uh, I dropped out of college. My dad died. Uh, I got an eviction notice from my apartment. Uh, my apartment rent was $135 a month. It counted heat and hot water. I had about a $12 electric bill a month. But I, I had an eviction notice from my apartment because I was two months behind in the rent, even though it was that cheap. And I got arrested for assault on a police officer. It was the last time I got arrested, but, you know, I'd gotten arrested the first time when I was 11. Uh, I was in court for multiple counts of grand larceny at 15. But when I was 19, <clears throat> then I, got, I got a pretty serious arrest, which was arrest on assault on a police officer. Um, those were the four things that didn't kill me. The two things that actually helped me, I passed my real estate license and I... Uh, bought my first rental house. And so frequently when I, when I speak into, uh, a, a, into a situation that's a rezoning or a special use permit to, to where we're going in and begging and pleading the city officials to please allow us to open up a business. And, and even though we don't have but 13 parking places and you want us to have 15 parking places, please make a special exception for us because we're going to pay tax money and really help the city. You know, I tell that story and I say, I may not look 19, but I'm just a 19 year old that just got an eviction notice. But I also just bought my first rental house. 
you know, please allow these people to buy their first rental house or allow these people to do whatever it is that I relate to buying my first rental house. So that's, if you hear, if you break down that story, my story is a story of failure and success. I mean, what people know about is the successes. What people don't know about is the failure and the trauma and the pain and the mistakes and the stupid that I've done over and over and over and over again. And, and really success is not about success. Success is about failing forward when you fail because you're, everybody is going to fail multiple times. None of us are smart enough and experienced enough to grow significantly without failing frequently. And so that's that four to two ratio of those things that happened when I was 19, carry that forward in every season of my life. And I've done a few things that worked out and I did some things that people thought were crazy and it ended up being brilliant, even though I'm not. And then I did some things that were couldn't lose that fell flat on its face and just absolutely I got destroyed doing it. I've almost gone broke twice. You know, I've never been bankrupt, but you know, uh, it would have been easier to have gone bankrupt a couple of times, you know, than to have fought it out and, and stuck it out and, and just worked and worked and worked to try to overcome it. Um, I, I do probably have a reputation of, of working a lot and being busy, you know, uh, but I have a great life. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got, I have four kids. I have three others that kind of sort of call me dad. And I, I now have a collection of 13 grandkids that I'm crazy about and do things with. And, and uh, you know, I've got a grandkid that is a, a, a U.S. citizen and a citizen of the Czech Republic. Twice I've gone to Czech to pick him up and bring him back to the United States, just me and him. Once when he was three and once when he was about six. You know, we just made a big trip out of it and went through New York and spent a couple of days at the the uh, aeronautics museum up there and some other stuff. And anyway, so I've, 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 I've got a wonderful life, but it's a life full of failure, right? You, you guys didn't bring me on to, because you think I'm a failure, I guess, but I've had more failures than I've had successes. And it's, and so that's, that, that really, that telling that tiny little microcosm of being 19 helps you to understand my story and the details of what's gone right. Are, are less significant than overcoming what's gone wrong. F failures are interesting because in the moment you often feel like you can't get through it. You often feel like it's, it, or, it, it can't get worse or, or, or there's nothing to, to improve it or, or whatnot. When do you actively know, do you think you actively know when you're going through a, an actual failure, an actual rock bottom moment? Oh, and yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 had dinner with, I had dinner with an old friend of mine two nights ago, and I didn't even know that he had gone through a divorce. And uh, and and he wanted to just talk to me. And he actually told me the, the next morning that it was the first time, and it's a guy about my age, he said it was the first time that he's actually opened up with another man about what he went through when he was going through uh, his divorce. And, and he, and he said, I lost, you know, cause he had told me the night before he said he lost 60 pounds. And even though he is a very successful business person, he said, I didn't want to live. I got to the point where many, many, many times it wasn't worth living and I didn't want to live. Right. And it's like, you know, I, I know a, a, I've got a good friend right now that's not responding to me that is uh, going through all kinds of medical problems. He's only, he's been sober for about a hundred and 10 or 20 days, at least I hope he's still sober, you know, um, and, and, you know, you know, when you're going through it, man, you, you know, when you're going, I was investigated by the IRS or the criminal investigation unit of the internal revenue service of the United States of America with badge and gun. I was investigated for six and a half years. You know, when that's going on, you know, I've never had OSHA come after me. I'm, I've had the labor and wage board come after me for a week one time and that was a bad week, but it wasn't a big deal. But, you know, but can you imagine waking up every morning and going to bed every night, not knowing if the IRS is going to back a, a moving truck up to your house and remove your furniture? I mean, you don't know what they're going to do. They have the power to do anything. I'm not talking about an audit. I'm talking about a criminal investigation for six and a half years 
and they never told me why they were investigating me and they never accused me of a single incident not one incident in six and a half years did they ever say greg we think you did this here's a time you took tim ryan out to lunch and you spent 25 bucks and we think y'all were just socializing we don't think it was a business lunch they didn't give me one incident in six and a half years but wait so you still don't know i'm sorry you still don't know no they never told me it was that lunch <laughs> with Tim. I know it. <laughs> I'm just saying it's just so you know, you know when you're going through it. Yes. Yeah. You just got to get up every morning. And and of course, you know, I am a man of faith and I, I get up every morning and just thank God for the good and the bad, because there's a there's a place in the Bible that actually says I'm paraphrasing, but it actually says what's good is good and what's bad is good for you because of him. Right. And I believe that. And so is it, even though it, it, you know, I can get emotional and I can get sad and I can be unhappy. It's when it all, when it all boils down, I say, what's, I just realized, okay, you promised me what's good is good. Then what's bad is good for me. And so I, I do have that kind of faith. And that's, that's, that's been very, very helpful in getting me through the, the tough times where, you know, it was, uh, Hmm. I was dealing, you know, but I mean, think about it when, I mean, interest rates, when I got into real estate business, interest rates were 8%. We think 8% now is high. I got my real estate license when it was 8%. Real, the real estate interest rate went to eight and a half percent before I sold my first house, like two weeks after I got my license. And then I watched interest rates go from 8% or eight and a half percent to 17 and a half percent, a fixed rate loan for VA, FHA or conventional was 17 and a half percent, right? That's tough, you know, but I've been through these things. You Do you know when you're going through them? Oh man, you know, you just fight it out, it, fight it out, fight it's, it out. It's funny you say that. Like I asked my mom like a year ago when people were, were complaining about the, the, the rates. And I was like, so when you bought our childhood house, like what was the rate? She's like 13, 13%. I was like, oh, wow. So we're, we're way lower. Like, damn, like what are we bitching about? Like people bragged about how smart they were getting a 13 and a half percent loan when rates hit 15 and yeah. 16. They were geniuses. When rates hit 17, the people that <laughs> we're the smartest in the world loans were, were total geniuses. Wow. Now, I mean, I can, I, I now can say, hey, I'm pretty smart or the banks have been good to me because I refinanced almost all of my rental properties at around three and a quarter percent a few years ago. So thank goodness for bankers that loved me or believed in me or cared about me or some, whatever they did. I don't know if they really loved me or care about me, but, you know, but so there, there's so, so been some successes, right? That's a success. But yeah. think about, think about when I was paying prime interest rate on a construction company when it was 21 and a half percent prime interest rate was 21 and a half and I was not prime. They were charging me 23 and a half. I was two points over prime because I was unprime or whatever you are when you're not their best customer. 23 and a half percent interest on a construction on a construction company. It was it's just like, I mean, stuff happens, but what do you do? And see what I see, what I've seen so many other people do that started like me as a real estate agent. When the tough times came, they went to work at the shipyard. When the mm. tough times came, they went, they went back and there's nothing wrong with working the shipyard. I love the shipyard. I have tons of friends that have had phenomenal careers in the shipyard, right? But they went to work at what they would have called a regular job. And, and if you lose your entrepreneurial spirit and you lose your entrepreneurial vision, when you fail, and go get a regular job. There's nothing wrong with a regular job, but if you're destined to be an entrepreneur, if you're designed to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be an entrepreneur like me, then you've got to embrace failure, overcome it, get past it, and then go for the next thing and work your butt off to get out of the hole. Did your appetite for risk grow over time or have you always had an appetite for risk? Uh, <laughs> the, the riskiest thing, I probably have ever done was three years ago. Um, so I guess it's grown. Um, but, you know, because I did something that was really risky three years ago, buying a piece of property and counting on a city to rezone it from residential to industrial. And I would have lost a lot of money if they had not done that rezoning. And there's no way you can assure that you're going to get a rezoning, of course. And residential to industrial seems to be a far stretch. And it would take a 
long time to tell all of the details of that story, but now we ended up with, uh, I brought in some, some, some partners, some people that have, that are experts at building industrial parks. We brought in the biggest industrial park builder in the country. And, uh, and they're now the, the senior partners on that, and I've taken a back seat to them. But we're actually building an 840,000 square foot industrial park in, uh, in a local city on 60 acres. It's going to provide about 300 local jobs. It's pretty cool. And for the city that did that rezoning, it's going to provide about a million to probably up over two million a year in tax revenue to run that city. Uh, but but as, in terms of risk, you know that was a that was a big risk for me because we would have. I would have lost a lot of money if that rezoning hadn't gotten through, but I believed in it. And so I think I've probably always had what I'm going to guess if it was analyzed and scrutinized, I've probably always had what I think a normal person would call an unhealthy risk tolerance. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, if I was really smart, then I probably wouldn't have taken a lot of the risks that I've taken, but I'm not that smart. And that's one of my best assets uh, because I've, I've taken risks that have worked out enough that overall people like you guys look at me as being successful instead of saying, gosh, you failed 157 times, Greg. That's, that's who you really are deep down. <laughs> See, he, he, he's not only a mind reader, Tim, he's also putting words in our mouth because <laughs> we did not call him successful once. So I, I, I look at Greg Garrett as a failure. I mean, that's that's what he's told me he is. The numbers are clearly higher than the success. And so um, his MR has not been very strong today. So let's I love let's it. Let's <laughs> it on you a little bit more. Yeah, I love it. Zach, I know why you have that guy behind you, the little guy over your right shoulder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, you know, I'm not going to share it with the audience, but I admire you <laughs> and love you and respect you anyway. Well, thank you. Even though I don't know you as well as I know Tim, I do. Well, you. That's fine. I want to jump into some other, but you got some other things that you got kicking around too, uh, business wise. A lot of people know you from the real estate side, but uh, you've also, if you, you have a, a likeness, I guess, for the water. Love the water. Love the water. I do not ever remember learning to water ski. But there's a newspaper article, the first new place I ever turned it. I, I, the first place I ever appeared in the newspaper was when I was six years old, uh, skiing behind my dad's boat. And a newspaper reporter stopped by and he said, who are these little midgets skiing? Why do we have these midgets out there skiing? And uh, that's that's you know, I know that that's not a correct term that we don't we don't use that term anymore. But that's what he, this this particular reporter said. He called his photographer to take pictures of these midgets and waited for us to come back in and realize that it was my brother and I six and seven years old. So I don't remember learning how to fish. I don't remember learning how to swim. I don't remember learning how to sail. I mean, I guess I remember learning how to sail probably I, because I did start sailing at about maybe eight or nine years old. And, uh, and so when I tried to join a sailboat, uh, company there's a company here locally called sale time s-a-i-l-t-i-m-e sale time and and i couldn't get anybody to return my call so finally when i got somebody to return the call i i you know i was trying to become a member of this company where you you actually for a small fraction of what it costs to own a boat you can act like you own a boat you can use that boat three to seven days a month you don't ever clean it. You don't ever fix it. You don't ever paint the bottom. You don't ever pay insurance. You don't ever do anything. You just get on it, go sailing, come back in and tie it up and leave. And you don't have to worry about it in a hurricane or any other time. Um, and I, uh, I, but because I couldn't get anybody on the phone, I finally, when the, the guy answered, I said, are you the owner? And he said, no, Wayne's up in DC. And I said, oh, when's he get back? He says, no, no, no. Wayne lives up in DC. And so it, light bulb okay you guys that are running this company do not care you guys are slack and wayne is detached he's in dc this is people like me want to get on the water and we don't want the cost of a sailboat we don't want the cost of maintenance and dockage and insurance we don't want the hassle of keeping it up and so i'm going to buy that company and i got in touch with wayne and bought the company 
Uh, and so now we've expanded it. We're training the military as well as mostly civilians. I mean, most of what we do is train civilians, but we have a we have the American Sailing Association School where we train anybody that wants to learn how to sail a sailboat, the types of sailboats you can sleep on, the keel boats and catamarans, the ones that will not flip over. Uh, and we teach uh, we teach people how to sail right here in Norfolk. And then we certify people. So if, if Zach decided he wanted to go down to the Caribbean and charter a sailboat and captain his own boat without hiring a captain and take some family and friends with him, uh, we can certify uh, Zach to do that in about a week or 10 days to certify to be on a catamaran. We, we can actually and teach. And you will never see me again. <laughs> we can actually teach uh, somebody like Ryan to sail a sailboat in a weekend. Uh, but that's the minimum certification just to be able to take one out, not not to you know be able to be to go charter one, you know, in a faraway place. But uh, it takes a little longer. But again, it's seven to ten days. But we teach people our biggest course that we teach all the time, and it's really pretty cheap. Is uh, is just to teach mostly couples, but you know, singles couples uh, to uh, to sail a sailboat, which only takes pretty much you know uh, two days. So that now it all makes sense. Why you're in the uh, the IV nutrition game? You go you go out sailing, you come back dehydrated, and you need to uh, replenish all your fluids. That ma that makes sense to me. Or we have a charter company too with a sailboat. Or if you go out and you're you know as a as a charter guest and you drink too much, you know you might need the IV therapy company there too. But no, the IV therapy company. I've always been interested in wellness and longevity. You know, I uh, my plan is to live to be 104 and to be uh, jet skiing and sailing and snow skiing with my great grandchildren. You know, that's my plan. I, you know, I, I've made plans before that have not worked out. And I've made <laughs> other plans before that have uh, far exceeded. So maybe I'll live to be 114. But my hope and is to live to be 104 and I want to feel good. And so we developed a company that is all about helping people feel better. Uh, be healthier, live longer, you know, and, uh, and that's the IV nutrition business. You know, we have a, our first location is in Suffolk and our second location is in Virginia Beach. And our third location will probably be Williamsburg or Newport News. We're working towards that now. But anything why, that's why? in those areas. It's, I feel like that's kind of a new fad, a new thing that people have gotten into, or at least maybe from a marketing perspective, people getting drips and IVs and stuff like that. It, what's the benefit of doing something like that? I mean, you use the hangover cure, but like, why should someone go in there? When should they go in there? What, like, yeah. Good it, question. it just seems like it's an, it's a new thing. And I'm interested in like, what was attractive to you? What is attractive from it, from other people's perspective? I've never done one. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but it's, it's just, you know, I, I've, it, it seems like they're the new fad. So a uh, new, yes, fad, no, in, in my opinion. And so um, it's in the re there's a so 95% of what we do is wellness. It's not hangover recovery. Um, but the <clears throat> the wellness aspects, we need all of us are deficient in something. Now, you know, my wife, I was telling the story to somebody and my, my wife's not with me right now, but I was telling the story and I was saying, you know, you go in and you, you one of the first things we, we recommend that you do is you get your blood work done and then you'll know where you're deficient. And my wife chimed in and said, you know, Greg didn't have to get his blood work done. And the, the lady looked at my wife and said, well, why not? Uh, she says, well, because I know all of his deficiencies. <laughs> so, so, but we, but for guys like Tim and guys like you, Zach, you know, you do your blood work, you find out what you're deficient in, and you're going to be deficient in magnesium or potassium or iron or uh, vitamin D, right? There's going to be something you're deficient in. And, and then there'll be other things that could enhance your health. Like I take an NAD shot every, every week. Well, I never even knew what an NAD shot was, but it, um, it, it helps your cognitive ability. It helps your, it helps your, you to be, you know, uh, just healthier and more alert, and more mentally alert. It just, it's a, it's a great natural substance. Um, the other thing is vitamin D. I'm short on vitamin D, so I get a vitamin D shot. And uh, we have weight loss. We have weight loss bags and shots and IVs. We have immune system boosters. There's a gentleman that comes in to our Suffolk location 
pretty much every Monday and every Friday. And uh, he's on the road four days a week. And he gets an immune booster when he comes back. I mean, when he went before he leaves to get on an airplane, uh, either on Sunday afternoon or, or Monday morning, he gets an immune booster. And then when he gets back on Thursday night or, or Friday morning, he comes in and he gets an, an energy like B12 and some some things that, you know, enhance his energy. Because we, what he was doing the, the, by being in, in planes and airports and traveling, he was running himself down. His immune system was, as he got a little bit older, he's not old, I think he's in his 40s. But his, his immune system was not keeping up or it was getting sick more frequently. And then when he got home for the after working all week, running around, whatever, whatever he's doing out of town, he was crashing on the weekends. And he was a bad husband, bad father in his own words. And it wasn't because he didn't have the energy to get out and do the things that he used to do when he was in his 30s. And so now, it, you know, he says it's totally life changing for him because he's not getting sick because he gets the immune booster before he goes. He has pretty good energy and already had pretty good energy for the three or four days that he was gone. And he was kind of geared up and his adrenaline's flowing, I guess, because he's working, but he's not crashing on the weekends anymore. So now he comes in and he gets the uh, the energy pack. You know, the, it's like for athletes, we do things for athletes and and, and he takes like something for athletes to, to energy booster and he has good weekends. He comes back Sunday night. Monday morning, gets the immune shot and he's good to go. So it, it's those types of things. The other thing is like I, for personal experience, I'm low on vitamin D. It's not way low, but I was taking a little teeny tiny little vitamin D pill every day. After a year and a half, it started messing with my stomach. So 85% ish, it's not an exact number, but 85% ish of what goes in your mouth and goes down in your stomach does not get absorbed. But what it does do, it messes with your stomach. And so I damaged my stomach lining by some things that I was taking that were, that were good for my body. So vitamin D is good for you. Neutral, regular vitamins are good for you, right? You know, multivitamins are good for you. But you, you, know, you dismiss most of that through urine and you don't get the benefit of 85% of it if you put it in your stomach. But you do take the chance, like me, of actually hurting your stomach lining. And so you're doing it intravenously or doing it in the form of a shot. And I used to hate shots, but our needles are teeny, teeny, tiny. And, I, you know, it seems like it seems like I'm, I would be that this that wouldn't change. But I when I get a shot now, it's, it's not a big deal, uh, even though I've really hated shots all of my life. But uh, uh, but we just, you know, the guys and gals that you know, know how to do them and make it painless. Like one of the things if you get a shot at the top of your hip, I never knew this until they taught me this you 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 get the shot you stand on one leg and you get the shot on the leg that you're not standing on that way your muscles not tight and so now when i get a shot on the top part of my you know the lower part of my back or the top of my butt when i get a little shot with a tiny little needle i actually barely feel it because that leg up in the air and so just little things like that but i'm not messing my stomach up and i'm getting the benefit of the nutrients and so i'm i'm nad Vitamin D every single week. Um, the vitamin D is every other week. I know for me, it's amazing to me uh, how much just in your in my joints or whatever, you know, how you feel it when you're starting to get dehydrated and have some deficiencies from that standpoint. It'd be interesting. I, I would be almost scary to find out what my blood work would tell me that. Uh, you need, but you need to know. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, I think about it. I mean, I, I look pretty good for 86. <laughs> hundred, yeah, hundred. Don't you why, think so? why settle at one hundred and four? You should just shoot for one hundred and fourteen. Uh, prob I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably increase it when I do get in my eighties. I'll probably increase that number. But right now, I'm happy with one hundred and four. It's thirty-eight more years. I'd be good with that. You doing the math? Are you doing the math? <laughs> I just read your mind. Tim was doing the math, Zach. I caught him. I caught him doing the math. His eyes twitched a little bit. As, as right. he he, up later. I'm not sure he was doing that. He did his math this morning with his uh, daily habit tracker called Elevate, which helps him uh, increase his brain uh, thing. I don't know. But 
he only wants to do math once a day. I can promise you that. And well, um, for himself, I'm telling you, I read his mind. He was doing the math. <laughs> lie, Tim. Lie about I it. I was, I was, I was trying to do that. I was going to do the math, but then I saw, I, I saw that. I thought that I saw Zach doing the math. So I was like, well, I'm just going to let Zach do it. What did he say? 104 and he's 34 away. I mean, that's an easy 38. 70. 38. 38. Okay. So that's 66. I mean, that's good math. Um, this doesn't have to be the last question, but like you, you talk about all these surrounding places in, in, in the region. If you were to have a short term rental and be an Airbnb host and someone came in and they said, hey, Greg, I'm here. What food item, what food restaurant, what what place should I go and partake in uh, while, while I'm here? Where are you telling them to go eat? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, it, it depends on where the where they're staying, because, I mean, every place has uh, some fantastic every city and, and every parts of cities. Really, we have good restaurants all over the place, except. So you're our, running for mayor is what you're telling me. You're very, very, very a politician. Answer. No, High Street. I mean, look at some of the places on High Street. Look at look. I mean, there, there, there's several new restaurants, Lola's and. And and uh, you know Captain Groovy's just got bought by the uh, the owner of uh, Aberdeen Barn, and that's you know it's getting better. Stoney's down in Ocean View, you know. I mean, it just we've, we've got nice Phoebus in Hampton has cool places. The Oceanfront has some cool places that are that are coming up. I mean, it just there are good restaurants all over the place, and so you you know you do. I would say do something within walking distance, right, or a short Uber distance, or like in the case of the Oceanfront. Do something where you you know you get the free ride back and forth, especially if you want to have a drink or two or three or four when you're at dinner. All right, so I heard like maybe one and a half answers there. So um, <laughs> thank you for that very pleasant well, answer. Think, yeah, Baker's wife and Phoebus is one of my favorites. What's your favorite? What's your favorite place to go to in the region to eat? I, I don't have a favorite, but I, I mean, again, okay. Baker's wife is a good one. Uh, there's a. Um, Oh gosh, uh, fish fish pig, uh, in in uh, downtown Norfolk. Is it fish pig? Big fish. Gosh, now I yeah I get the, Is that on the one email sold Yes, yes, yes. The old Starbucks. Yep, I think it is the old Starbucks. That's a cool okay. little funky place. I mean, I like the Italian restaurant in um, on Granby Street. Uh, what's with the rooftop? What's it called? Leonas. Yep. Leonis. Yep, I like that. Yeah, I mean, so there, we've got cool restaurants all over the place. You know, you, you don't have to drive all over town to get to go there. But yeah. I mean, tonight I'm having dinner with with friends at, uh, as I mentioned, Baker's wife in, in Phoebus. Fuller's, I mean, Fuller's in Phoebus is phenomenal. Uh, it just, you know, it's uh, Fuller's slogan when I was a kid is eat dirt cheap at Fuller's. And Fuller's is uh, under new ownership, but it's still around in a new location of Phoebus. So. You know, there's, there's cool places everywhere. Gosh, I feel like there is so much that uh, the so much left that we have to talk about. This was a fast hour. We can do it again if you want to. If I uh, didn't talk too much. No, it's just, yeah, there's a lot that we still have. We'll have to have a part two at some point because I would love to get your take on uh, EO and I would love to get your take on. RVA 757 connects and uh, you, you have so much involvement with the region that we all could learn a lot from you. Happy to do it. And EO for your listeners that don't know what that means. It's entrepreneurs organization. And the chapter here in uh, 757 is called Southeastern Virginia entrepreneurs organization of Southeastern Virginia, but it's an international organization in eh, close to a hundred countries, I think with thousands of members of small business people. And it's something that is a good, it's a good place to create a, for a peer group for the kinds of things that, you know, Zach, Tim, you and James Doe and, and Paul Nolte and, and others are doing that uh, at 757 CoLab and the Assembly and all the other organizations that are connected to that. Uh, it's, it's really a peer group for people that reach at least $250,000 in revenue. It used to be a million, but now there's a level called the Accelerator that um, that they can they can join and have a peer group of other entrepreneurs because lawyers and accountants are important, but peers are essential, and especially to help you pick get up when you fail and keep going. Well, well, fun fact, 
the four in Fervent Four is based off of a quote that I heard at a EO event, I believe at the TED in 2015, that said only 4% of businesses ever reach the annual million dollar mark. So the four in that is the, sh- or the four in Fervent Four is helping founders, businesses, entrepreneurs get to that 4% of, of businesses, uh, which is the million dollar mark. So sweet and that's what e- we did. eo has been living in our lives for 205 ish right. episodes that is awesome i did not know that tim held that information from me i know <laughs> probably, I know. And probably I'll, maliciously held that maliciously. information from me i agree yeah, and very nice. that was the same that was the same event that i hustled myself on uh, into to uh, become the host of Hampton Roads Business Weekly on ABC way back when. I did my first interviews there and interviewed a bunch of folks. Um, I think Martin was one of them, Kevin Daisy from Array, some other folks too. But that that event that they held, kind of the first kind of big EO event way back when, 10 years ago. You helped, so, you helped Damon John get his success too, right? I did, I did, yeah. just, just in a 10 minute interview. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, Zach, you, so. have, you, have, you have the power of the guy over your right shoulder. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I I do have his power. I and I'm going to see him live and in the flesh in two days. So oh, is he gonna be there? Be, he will. Hmm. That's cool. You should take mm-hmm. him and I with you, by the way. That's not what's going through my mind right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Tim, I feel neglected, man. I don't know about you. Well, I know the backstory. There, the not that it's a, really a backstory, but uh, I think if, if Zach could take us, he probably would. But it was. A good I don't think you would enjoy yourselves. Well, you, you, Megan loves wrestling now. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you're the person. You're the ambassador for uh, wrestling. Of course, I'm going to WrestleMania in Philly on on this weekend, Greg. That's what. And the rock is going to be there so it will be a uh quite an experience it's like uh weather well, gonna hold out for yeah. it it looks like it yeah <laughs> it'll be a little chilly but I uh, still feel neglected i mean uh, you know <laughs> you, your your understanding of that but i i feel a little neglected all right well there's seats in the car if you guys want to go but i'm not buying your tickets let's just put it like that <laughs> Uh, Greg, it's been great. Pleasure meeting you. Um, it's been wonderful. Yeah, Good thanks love. for all you do, Greg. I look yeah. forward to seeing you around the region. I see love you all the doing, time. Yeah, love doing it. And uh, whatever whatever I can do, if you guys uh, have a good idea, run it past me. I'll, I'll probably say yes. Well, we'll do this in at least uh, 52 weeks because we need all the data points from you, your new tires to tell That's us right. the real story. And I do think that... I, you know, I, I think that the whole investigation thing is that you shouldn't have the, the state or all the local governments paving your own lane. You know, that's that's probably where the mismatch was. Right. You got to open that up. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to it's nice to feel special and have my own lane when traffic is at a dead stop. Agreed. Well, thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. <laughs>